indeed. Good evening, everyone. And can I say what a great pleasure, indeed an honour it is, to be addressing the Gloucestershire branch of the Historical Association. Um, I would be very pleased to be with you in person this evening, but we all know why that's not possible. So I hope you'll enjoy uh, this on-screen presentation. Now, uh, when I said a moment ago um, that this was a very big presentation to Andrea, it certainly is. In fact, it's, I think it's somewhat of a crazy topic to try and talk in an hour about because we've got so much to say. Um, I suspect if I was with you in person and I could do a little bit of a Q&A with you now and I asked who founded the police in England, quite a lot of you would not inaccurately answer Sir Robert Peel. Well, I'll invite you to reconsider that answer now because if we just take a look at how the history of policing developed in this country, we've really got to go a lot further back than Sir Robert Peel. I've shown here two images of very ancient kings indeed. They're representative of the kingdoms that were in place at the time they reigned. They're not meant to be the exact historical replicas of who founded the English policing. But the king on the left of your screen is King Alfred the Great. The king on the right of your screen is King Edward I. And both of them have very important parts to play in the way that policing in this country grew up, organically grew up from about a thousand years ago. Neither of them would have used the term police. That's a much later term. It came into our language towards the end of the 16th century. We got it from France. The French got it from Latin. Latin got it from Greek. It means polis, comes from the meaning of the way towns are organised and governed. And we get other words from polis as well. We get politics. We get policy. They're all from the same Greek root. But we certainly had a concept of how the community kept law in order, and it goes right back to the Anglo-Saxon origins of our kingdom in this country. And the way that the law and order organisation grew up was around communities, essentially around villages. They had various names in Anglo-Saxon times, townships being one of them, and each village was responsible for looking after its own affairs. It answered to a wider organisation, the Shire, over which there was the king's representative, the Shire Reeve, that became the sheriff. And of course, that locked into greater earldoms and the kingdom itself. But that was all quite remote for everyday people. Everyday people lived in villages and roughly there were about 10 families in each village when they started way back in the 6th, 7th century. That 10 families became known as a tithing and they were expected by custom and practice to elect one of their members to become their representative, their headman, probably for a year. The election took place in an organisation called the court leet, the people's court, literally what that meant. And it was the adult male members of the community who attended that. They were the free men of their village and they would elect one of their member to be their tithing man. And slowly but surely over the centuries, that tithing man became recognised as the key link between what we would now call central government and the local community. But the key aspect of this is this local election. Now, by the time the Normans came, 1066 and all that, uh, they simply took over the system of local administration that they inherited from the Anglo-Saxons. But they added their own spin to it. The first bit of the spin to it they added was they started creating statutes. Those statutes might be something to do with labour, might be something to do with local taxation, required somebody to be the king's representative in the local community. And the person they chose was the one who was already there, the tithing man. It's just that the Normans didn't call them the tithing man. Slowly, over the centuries, they began to use a word that they were comfortable with, they were used to using in their home territories in France. And that was the word connetable, literally the count of the stable. 
we think today the count being a very grand figure, an earl is the equivalent um, in our own peerage. But back in the Middle Ages, the count was somebody who had delegated authority from either the local lord or from the king. And this delegated authority in this particular respect dealt with dealing with horses. Seems strange thing for us to associate looking after the stables with looking after law and order, except when you realize the stables were a very important part of any medieval organization. So the term count of the stable got transferred to the tithing man. And we, of course, got from that our very English sounding word, constable. So there we have it. The constable back in the Middle Ages is a locally elected figure. But the law they were enforcing came from the king. And when we talk about a constable today, the definition of a constable still has those two concepts welded together in a single sentence. A citizen locally appointed holding authority under the crown. That is exactly what a constable was in the time of Alfred the Great and Edward the Confessor and William the First, and it is exactly what it is now. A citizen locally appointed holding authority under the crown. But of course, medieval society wasn't just about villages. It was about towns as well, the boroughs that were slowly beginning to develop. And that king, King Alfred, is the person who started the development of the boroughs. But they were, of course, taken over, like everything else, by the Normans. And by the time we get to this other king I've shown here, King Edward I, they were beginning to lay down regulations about how the whole kingdom should behave. And one of the regulations that Edward I laid down in the Statute of Westminster was how to keep the town watch. At night, when everybody should be asleep, somebody had to be making sure that the curfew was being complied with, that strangers weren't walking the streets, that nobody had infiltrated from beyond the city walls. And citizens were given that job as well. And it depended on how big a town you had. If you were a small town, a township, then you had to have a watch of about six. If you were a very large town, it might be a dozen or even 18. Those regulations were set down by Edward I and they were still being applied actually some centuries later because by the time we get to the Elizabethan and early Jacobean period we have a snapshot of how that system was still operating several centuries after Edward and Alfred and we see it from Shakespeare's play Much Ado About Nothing and it's in the character of Dogbury and here we have an engraving showing Dogbury, the rather rather large pompous figure you can see in the foreground, he is the constable. He's been elected by his own peer group in the local court leet, and he is exercising his authority. You can tell he's got all that authority because he's holding a large tip staff with a crown indicating he holds that authority under the king. But he's assisted by another figure to the left of the engraving, holding a shorter tip staff, and that's a head borough. That's an assistant. That's his assistant. It's a man called Verges. Now, Verges has been doing this job for years, and he's getting paid, because what's happening here is we're seeing a bit of attention. Dogbury is a man on the up. He is a local citizen of some repute. A bit bumptious, but a citizen of some repute. But this is going to take up time from his day job, which is being a farmer, being a merchant, whatever it is, making money. So he wants to delegate the administration of his job to somebody else, to somebody who's paid to do it. And we have that in the form of the Headborough Verges. But the Night Watch is still operating here. Here is the group of local citizens that all volunteered. None of them have been paid and they've been called out to do their turn keeping the watch. And you can see very much in that engraving. And if you hear the play or read the word to the play, you get their total indifference to the job that is before them. They don't want to be here. In fact, what happens in the play is this little group of misfits are instrumental in making sure that the hero and the heroine actually survive and live happily ever after. But they are reluctant heroes indeed. And that's why by the beginning of the 17th century, 
Stogbury's job is being given over to professionals, professional watchmen. And we've got an example here in this early Jacobean engraving here. You can see the classic night watchman. He's there, he's got a bell, he's got a staff, he's got a lantern, and he's got a dog. Now he's gonna go around with a team of about perhaps half a dozen, dozen others keeping watch and ward over their local bit of the town. And every hour through the night, they're going to call the hour. They're gonna shout out one o'clock in the morning and all's well. They're not doing that to the citizens. The citizens should be asleep in their beds. They're doing that to each other. They're telling each other that they're all well. And the common law, begins to give them some powers. Anybody they find walking the streets after the curfew is fair game to be stopped and searched and interrogated, and if necessary, locked up to the magistrate sees them the following morning, the justice of the peace. The justice of the peace has evolved slightly behind the office of constable. Office of constable goes right back to the origins of Anglo-Saxon in England. The Justice of the Peace comes along in the 13th and the 14th century, a much later office, but one of great authority nevertheless. Now, the job of the constable, the job of the watchman, was to prevent crime from happening, to prevent it by their presence. But what happened? Now, that was quite unlikely in the 16th and 17th century, because there wasn't, frankly, much to steal. And if you were wealthy enough to have something worth stealing, you were wealthy enough to look after it. But by the time we get to the end of the 17th century, the beginning of the 18th century, we're beginning to see our society expand. Towns are growing, growing very quickly compared to how they'd grown in the centuries before. And they were becoming relatively disorderly places. And wealth was beginning to spread. Not much by modern standards, but enough by the standards of the time. People had goods, consumer goods, that were worth stealing and were worth selling on the illegal black market. Well, what happened if you were a victim of such a crime? Well, in theory, you had to go and look after it yourself. You had to go and track down the offender. Maybe you would do it by offering a reward. But obviously that was quite difficult to do. So you got a professional, a kind of private detective to do it for you. And these people were called thief takers. And in the early 18th century, it became quite a business. There was a bit of a crime wave in the early 18th century as the war of Spanish succession came to an end. Demobbed troops hit the streets and they were looking for jobs. And if they couldn't find jobs, they started to steal. So how did society of the time combat that? Well, Parliament passed an act offered a huge reward for information leading to convictions. 40 pounds, it actually made 80 pounds. This is the early 18th century, so this is a small fortune if you could bring somebody to conviction. And this is what the thief takers did. And the most famous of them all was this man here in this engraving, Jonathan Wilde, who was so famous and so good at his job, he became known as the thief taker general. There was just a bit of a problem with Jonathan Wilde, and the problem was he was venal, he was corrupt, and in fact he ran his own team of thieves, and he was setting up jobs, setting up the, uh, the conviction, and getting the reward and profit from stolen goods along the way. It all came to grief. He was eventually convicted, like Al Capone, centuries later, on a minor charge, and hanged at Tyburn. Such was the penalty for getting caught for crimes of property in the early 18th century. And this, here we have a snapshot of the crimes of property in the early 18th century from William Hogarth. This is a, from a set of engravings called The Idle and the Virtuous Apprentice. And here we have The Idle Apprentice. The Idle Apprentice starts the same path as The Virtuous Apprentice, but goes astray. And soon he loses his job. Soon he's a petty thief, a footpad, but then he graduates to the pinnacle of criminal activity, a highwayman. But even a highwayman, a successful one, has to be able to fence the goods, get rid of the goods. And this is what he's doing here in this night cellar. He's fencing the goods. You can see them taking place in the center of the engraving. 
But alas for him, he is undone because his girlfriend, his doxy, has betrayed him to the constable. And you can see the constable coming down the steps. There he is holding his tip staff. And behind him, there's the night watch. They've come to arrest the degradation of the idle apprentice. But as the 18th century developed, the problems of how to order our burgeoning towns became critical. Here's another Hogarth engraving. This is the famous one, Gin Lane. And you can see in the back there, the pinnacle, the spire of St. Giles Church. This is a real location in London. Maybe Hogarth has exaggerated the scene to prove his point, but this is the kind of chaos that was happening in London, the mega city of the 18th century. London doubled in size through the 18th century. And as you can see, the resources of what was still a medieval form of local government with still amateurs trying to police the city was breaking down. And this is the reason why each parish in London, Greater London as we would now call it, was responsible for its own law and order, for its own constables, its own watch. Some of them were very good at it. Some of them were not semi-professional, but professional. Some of them were very wealthy. Marleburn, for example, a very wealthy um, uh, uh, parish. St. George Hanover Square, another wealthy parish that could put the money behind uh, its night watch. Others over in the east, like St. George in the east, Whitechapel, no, they weren't so wealthy and they had to make do with what they had. Critically, there was no coordination between these parishes. They were sorting the problems out for themselves. So it was a bit of a mismatch as to what was going on between the forces of law and order and crime. And in the middle of the century, there were ideas about how this should be sorted out. There were pamphlets flying around in the middle of the 18th century about what we would now call police reform. But the two men who were the most cohesive in their thinking and the most practical in the application of their thought are these two individuals, Henry and John Fielding. Henry, the novelist, of course, Tom Jones and all the, his other novels, but that was his spare time hobby. His day job was as the city magistrate for Westminster. He got the job through the influence of the Duke of Bedford, uh, but he nevertheless made a real fist of the job, very successful at it. The only magistrate in the country to be paid. All the others were voluntary gentlemen who did it as part of their uh, job of being one of the great and good in their locality. Henry Fielding was paid for it. And he set up a team, a small team of professional thief takers. Now, there was a difference between the kind of service that he was providing and what Jonathan Wilde had provided. Jonathan Wilde was payment by results. Fielding managed to persuade the government of the day under Henry Pelham, the prime minister, to give him a grant. It came out of the Secret Service Fund, so no questions asked in the House of Commons. And he was able to set up a team of permanent professional constables operating from his home and office in Bow Street. Yes, of course, we've arrived at the Bow Street Runners. Fielding Henry did not hold his job for very long. He became ill, he resigned, and after a couple of years in retirement, he died. But his work was and his ideas were carried forward by his younger brother, John. John laboured under a great disadvantage. He was blind, but that did not stop him developing absolutely key thoughts about how policing should be done in what was now being called the metropolis, London, Westminster and the surrounding parishes. And his plan was for not only a professional team of thief takers, but a professional team of patrol officers. They were called Sir John's men. They worked out from Bow Street and they patrolled the arterial routes where, of course, the footpads and the highwaymen would gather. After a while, they developed not only a foot patrol, but a mounted patrol. The concept of fully professional policing was in London a full 50 years before Peel came up with his reforms.
Now, the reason behind the kinds of reforms that uh, Fielding was developing was the problem that we see encapsulated here. Our idle apprentice now has been arrested, tried, ironically, by his former colleague, the virtuous apprentice, who's now become Lord Mayor of London, and he has been sentenced to death at Tyburn. Here it is, Tyburn Tree, that triangular feature you can see just towards the centre right of the engraving. Um, a very peculiar way of hanging people. They weren't, of course, hanged by a quick drop and the breaking of the neck. They were left to dangle there. And they had to sort of throw themselves off the beam of that triangular structure. Very strange. But far from acting as a deterrent, this is what could happen if you get caught thieving. These were great spectacles. And some of these uh, highwaymen made speeches. They became heroes in the hour of their death. It wasn't working. The theory of capital punishment as a deterrent for crimes, including up to the theft of one shilling value, wasn't working. Now, this wasn't just an English problem. It was one across Europe. And so, again, the great minds of the Enlightenment turned themselves to addressing the problem of crime and disorder. And the person we have to look at first in this chain of intellectual development is the man on the bottom left of the screen there, one Cesare Beccaria, Northern Italy nobleman. Beccaria became appalled by what he saw in Northern Italian prisons, and he wanted to do something about it. And he wrote a seminal work called On Crimes and Punishment. Within a few years of it being published in Italy, it was published in an English translation here. We certainly know that John Fielding read it and it had some great principles in it. The first principle was very simply, prevention is better than cure. You should aim to prevent crime, not punish it. So that's his first operating principle. He had another one, which is the test of utility, what we would now say, what works. He actually used a term, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now that was pretty quickly taken up at the end of the 18th century by the man in the middle of our screen there, Jeremy Bentham, the first of the utilitarians. And he really bought into the Beccarian principle of prevention rather than cure. At the time of the 1780s and the 1790s, his thoughts were not yet coalesced into his great works that were published in the early 19th century, but his ideas were there. And he shared them with a magistrate operating over in the east end of London, Patrick Calhoun. Patrick Calhoun had been born in Glasgow. He transferred to London. He was a successful merchant. He became a successful magistrate. And he was instrumental in the founding of the new docks that were being set up over in what we would now recognize as Dockland, Canary Wharf, all around there, the East Indian, the West Indian docks. The problem was there was massive pilfering going on in the docks and their hinterland. And Calhoun wanted to stop it. And his solution was what was be would become known as a preventative police, a permanent police force patrolling round Dockland, patrolling up and down the river, the Thames River Police. And in the 1790s, this was the first modern police force founded based on the ideas that Calhoun had developed with his friend Jeremy Bentham. But Calhoun put these ideas into print in what was a seminal work called The Treatise on the Police of the Metropolis, published in 1796. It went through umpteen editions over the next 20 years and was really influential. He was a best-selling author. He convinced people that what was necessary was a permanent preventive policing patrol, not just for each individual parish, but for the whole of the metropolis. By the, the 1810s, the 1820s, there was a lot of professional policing going on in London. Each parish by then had its own constable. Many of them were professional, paid, like Constable Scarborough, the man you see on the left. He's the paid constable for St. Margaret's Westminster. Marlebone had a very effective night watch there in the top right hand corner. They don't look very effective there, 
but believe you me, they were. They were an effective team of night watchmen. There were the Bow Street runners operating from Bow Street. When Field, the Fielding brothers both died, their institution stayed on, very effective. They are operating from Bow Street with their foot and horse patrols. Over in Ireland, meanwhile, there is a proper preventative police operating in the area outside of Dublin, the Irish Peace Preservation Force, started in 1816 by the then Irish Secretary, who was the Secretary of State for Ireland in 1816, Sir to England when he became Home Secretary in 1822. By that time, an awful lot was going on. The metropolis was now about one and a half million people and spreading without any kind of town planning or control. But what was happening in London was now happening across the provinces with the process that we know as the Industrial Revolution. New towns were springing up, new towns still having to use the system of local government and policing that had been developed in the age of Alfred and Edward and Elizabeth. But it wasn't just the towns. The countryside was changing too. We were having new agricultural methods being brought in. Here we can see an early threshing machine that was replacing intensive labor. People were becoming redundant, out of work. And at this point in time, although we think of the Industrial Revolution as being the flagship of historical development in the early 19th century, more people lived in the countryside than in the towns. The countryside was not some rural idyll or backwater. It's hardly surprising, therefore, particularly in the aftermath of the French Revolution, that this was a time of great political agitation. Here we can see the great demonstration that became a, a cause celeb the, at St. Peter's Field in Manchester in 1819. The yeomen were sent into what was feared to be a riot that was developing, and you can see what became known as the Peterloo Massacre that followed. Ironically, Manchester had a professional police force at that time, but they were stood to one side when the yeomanry went in, when the yeomanry went in uh, to disperse the crowd. What was concerning um, the people of political importance at the time was the problem of vagrancy. People who did not have the wherewithal to maintain their lifestyle. And of course, these people were poor. They wanted to drink, they wanted to gamble, they wanted to go to the theatre. This, as far as the ruling elite was concerned, had to be controlled because what vagrancy led to was this, street crime. This is, of course, the famous scene from Oliver Twist, the pickpocketing scene from Oliver Twist. But gangs of juveniles engaging in street crime was endemic in the early years of the 19th century. So what to do about it? Well, the catalyst started in 1811 with what was known as the Radcliffe Highway murder. A family were massacred in their beds in the east of London. The Thames police couldn't prevent it. The local watch couldn't prevent it. Eventually, somebody was identified by the magistrates as the possible murder, but he committed suicide before he was brought to trial. This shocked London society in the early 19th century and a House of Commons committee sat, examined the problems. It took seven years to report, but when it reported, it concluded that there should be a professional police for the whole of the metropolis. Nothing happened. In 1820, there was the trial of Queen Caroline, Queen Caroline's divorce from her, the King uh, George IV. Um, that isn't why it's important important for us. Why it's important for us is because there was great popular feeling for Queen Caroline. Disorder threatened. What did you do when disorder threatened? Well, like in Manchester, you sent in the army. The Duke of Wellington had to report to the government that the army might not be reliable. He was actually recommending a third force, a kind of gendarmerie who could be relied on in the event of disorder. In 1822, Peel became Home Secretary, coming over from Ireland, and he brought with him his ideas about what to do. But it took a long time for him to be able to develop his ideas and get them in place. Why? Because there was this great fear that a modern professional police force 
would be like the French police force, the gendarmerie. France was the anathema of English politics because on the one hand, they were either revolutionary or they or were authoritarian and repressive. Either way, what you didn't want was a French gendarmerie here. So there might be crime going rife on the streets, but local opinion, polit political opinion, was against any kind of major reform. In 1826, Peel told the House of Commons, I am strongly inclined to think there is but one effectual remedy. Well, he didn't get the chance to do much about it because he was out of office for a year. The Tories were out, the Whigs were in, were in for a whole year, nothing happened. But he came back in 1828, and by then, the Prime Minister is the Duke of Wellington. And the Duke of Wellington gave his backing to Peel for wholesale police reform in London. And a year later, the Metropolitan Police was born. It got through its complicated common stages almost without a murmur. By then, opinion had changed and it was agreed there should be a professional force operating day and night across roughly a seven mile radius from Charing Cross for the whole of the metropolis except the City of London. The City of London claimed its ancient privileges and was excluded from the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829. It remains an independent force surrounded by the great Metropolitan Police to this day. Two commissioners were appointed to set up the new force. Not one, two. It was felt it was important to diffuse power. So these two com commissioners were created and they complemented each other greatly. So Charles Rowan was a soldier, a veteran from the peninsula with Wellington. Sir Richard Main was a young up and coming barrister and the two skills complemented each other greatly. We think that Rowan had the philosophy, Main had the detail, but they combined together to produce the historic first instructions of the Metropolitan Police. And it says at the beginning of those instructions, it should be understood at the outset that the principal object to be obtained is the prevention of crime. They didn't have responsibility for the Bow Street Runners. They kept working by themselves independently for another 10 years. What Rowan and Maine provided was a uniform professional force, boots on the ground, 24 hours a day. Theory being that intense surveillance like this would prevent crime, especially vagrancy. Well, it was only a couple of years and the Tories were out of office. The Whigs were in. What were the Whigs going to do? Now, the Whigs were, by and large, people who believed in small government, a bit like the Republican Party in America today. That was the theory. They weren't interested in big government. But the times forced changes upon them. 1834, there were the toll puddle martyrs, illustrating that there was rural discontent. There was discontent in the towns and there was movement to local government reform. The Municipal Corporations Act set up new borough councils. And one of the clauses of the Municipal Corporations Act in 1835, steered through by Lord John Russell, the man in the picture on the left here, was that each borough had to set up a professional police force under a watch committee. So that dealt with the boroughs. But the rural areas where, as I said, over half the population still lived and where there was this seething discontent, what was to happen to them? Well, a royal commission sat in the late 1830s and concluded that there needed to be a professional constabulary for the rural areas. It recommended that it would be centrally based under the Home Secretary. The Whigs didn't like that and the Whigs decided that they would devolve it to the local magistrates sitting in committees. The committees of local magistrates would set up a professional police force. Uh, those committees were called quarter sessions and each shire had its own quarter sessions. But the 1839 County Act was a permissive act. It enabled counties to set up police forces. It didn't require them. The man who steered through the 1839 Act, the man on the right, hand of the screen there, Constantine Phipps, Marquis of Normandy. 
So when we come to the founders, the founding fathers of professional modern policing in this country, it's an honour that Sh Peel shares with Lord John Russell and with the Marquis of Normanby. Peel, a Tory, Russell and Normanby Whigs. The act that Normanby established would be changed about 15 years later when all of the counties were required to establish their own forces. Here's the uniform that was adopted. This is a later picture, but this is the uniform that was adopted really under no strict order from the centre. It's just that all the counties wanted to look like London and London officers looked like this. If you look at it, go back to that picture of Constable Scarborough at St. Margaret's. This is a uniform version of what Scarborough was wearing. Top hat, tail coat, high collar. It's just that the Metropolitan Police bought a job lot of blue surge and turned out the, all their officers in the single blue uniform. And that's how the blue uniform started for policing in this country. Scotland Yard was the first headquarters. It's at the back of this rather splendid building here. It's long disappeared. Uh, this is the building that appeared later in the 19th century. Probably many of you will be familiar with it through British crime dramas of the 1950s and 1960s. It is built, if you would like to know about these things, in the Scottish baronial style. It moved to that rather ghastly office block in the 1960s and it's now moved back to the embankment next door to that rather splendid building um, and there is new new Scotland Yard. Well how did these boroughs in the provinces get going? Well some of them were rather big rather splendid affairs. Bristol, borough that set up its force in 1835, had 230 officers. Bath, just down the road, 116. But some of these boroughs were pretty small indeed. Aberystwyth had two. Cheltenham, interestingly, was not a borough under the Municipal Corporations Act, but it had set up its own force under a private local act in 1831. What about the big modern industrial cities? Birmingham, Manchester, Middlesbrough. They weren't within the Municipal Corporations Act at this stage at all. They had to apply for borough status over the following years. And when they did, they acquired their municipal forces. And they were dressed like this rather splendid group at North Leach um, in their tailcoats and top hats. This is what a first chief constable looks like. The first county chief constable here of Gloucestershire, a man called Anthony Lefroy. He came from Ireland. He wasn't Irish, but he was in Peel's Peace Preservation Force, and he was the equivalent of what we would now call a superintendent. He came to Gloucestershire. He applied for the job. The Gloucestershire magistrates in quarter sessions appointed him without having seen him. His references were good enough. If it was good enough for the Secretary of State for Ireland, it was good enough for them. And he started work in Gloucestershire in December 1839. And Gloucestershire has a very good claim to being the first of the county forces in England and Wales. Over the succeeding decades, the boroughs grew in number, the counties grew in number, until by the end of the 19th century, there were over 200 forces in England and Wales. Some of them very large, like the Metropolitan, some of them still quite tiny, maybe only a handful or a couple of handfuls of officers. So what did the Home Office do in response to this? The Home Office didn't like this plethora of forces. They couldn't oversee it. They could not ensure what we would now call quality control. So in the middle of the 19th century, they introduced the Inspectorate of Constabulary. And the Inspectorate of Constabulary, there were only three of them, operated on a simple principle. They would go and inspect each force and issue a certificate of efficiency. If the force was deemed efficient, then the government would pay half the revenues of the force in question. It took a long time for the police to be accepted. Originally in London, there was hostility. Here's an example of local Paris hostility. There was hostility when the police got involved in suppressing political demonstrations like this one at Cold Bath Fields in London, where PC Cully was struck down, stabbed, and the jury, the coroner's jury, returned a verdict of justifiable homicide. 
Yet by the end of the next decade, the police had been accepted. This is the great Chartist demonstration um, in South London on Kennington Common in 1848. Completely peaceful. The Metropolitan Police had, from being a hostile occupying force in 1829, had become accepted. In the middle of the 19th century, we see a physical transition. This is a Gloucester officer, and you can see him earlier in the century, in the 1830s, in a very proud photograph in his top hat and tail coat. You can see his number 157G, 157 Gloucester. By 1865, and we can date it quite precisely to 1865, that's what he looks like. He's wearing his smart new uniform, and of course the famous police helmet has replaced the top hat. For reasons of practicality, they were deemed to be better at keeping the head dry, better at keeping the head cool in summer. The tail coat has been replaced by a full frontal coat, which kept him warmer and drier. A practical change to the police uniform that was going on nationally at that point. Gloucester, though, among the very first to accept it. I said a moment ago that the original Metropolitan Police was about uniform patrol. Detectives weren't recognised. That wasn't part of their remit. But as, as a result of a botched murder inquiry at the end of the 1830s, the Metropolitan Police started a detective branch. It was a handful of officers. They were all promoted sergeant, unless they happened to be the inspector, and they were all operated from Scotland Yard. And the most famous of them was the man on the left. And you may have heard of him because he became he was the subject of a television series. The investigations of Mr. Witcher. The man on the left is Inspector Witcher, a real life detective. How did the detectives do their job? Well, they went to pubs and places of ill repute and they listened and they watched and they operated in disguise. There you can see the CID in full disguise as opposed to their Sunday best. But when they were confronted with the kind of serial murder crime that the uh, Ripper crimes in East and Whitechapel murders represented, they were bereft of any kind of forensic techniques which would help them investigate the crime. That began to change towards the end of the century. Let's just take a step back and go back into the countryside at this point. Originally, the officers on country beats patrolled like their town, town opposites. They were given a beat and they walked miles. If you read the station books of the early Gloucestershire Constabulary, out at night the constables would go and they would walk down the Tetbury Road, they'd walk down the Cricklade Road for mile after mile. That changed towards the end of the 19th century when constables were given responsibility for policing a village, almost going back to the origins of policing in the Anglo-Saxon times. And they were given that responsibility to police it as they thought fit. But they had a lot of extra duties. It wasn't just about crime or disorder. It was about local administration. You can see the picture on the left there. That's in Andoversford here in Gloucestershire. They were a recruiting office for the British Army. Much later picture, but the principle is the same. They became the enforcers of agricultural restrictions and legislations. In this case, foot and mouth disease in the 1930s. At the beginning of the 20th century, this was a time of great political unrest in this country and the police were deployed to deal with strikes and strike breaking. This is probably the most famous of their deployments, the Tonopandi in 1910-1911, um, when the strikers set about looting and burning the shops of Tonopandi. The local chief constable, Captain Lindsay of Glamorgan, called in reinforcements from across the southwest of England and Gloucestershire and Bristol both sent contingents, although the South Wales force, which you can see here, were very skilled at dealing with public disorder. Here we have the famous scene at the Siege of Sydney Street when Winston Churchill was Home Secretary. Siege of Sydney Street about Eastern European anarchists who came here and this was a bank robbery that went wrong and the military had to be deployed because the police did not have the firepower to confront the anarchists holed up in Sydney Street. 
We then had the First World War. It took the heat out of all that political agitation, but it came back with a vengeance after the First World War, and this time with the threat of a communist takeover to boot. And worse still, the police went on strike. Their pay had fallen behind and they went on strike. A union was formed. Crisis. How did the government deal with this? Well, it sacked the union members and it then called in a royal commission under this man, the right hand side of the screen, Lord Desborough. And this had to be a way out for the government. They'd sacked the strikers, but they knew that wasn't good enough. They needed a way out and Lord Desborough provided it. First of all, he gave them a pay rise. And secondly, he allowed them to have a union. Only it couldn't be called a union. It be called the Police Federation. The Federation became part of the negotiating machinery for pay and policy, not just for the rest of the century, but right until this day. Cars came on the scene as well and forces began to adopt mobile patrols. This is the Gloucestershire Constabulary Mobile Patrol outside the old headquarters in Lansdowne Road. These cars lack an important capability. That capability is communications. The first time radios were deployed was at the 1919 Epsom Derby when the Metropolitan Police set up a very primitive uh, means of communication with, between Epsom and uh, the headquarters at New Scotland Yard. It wasn't until the 30s that cars started to get radios. They weren't very good. They were valve sets. They had batteries that ran down very quickly. But nevertheless, you could subtly communicate with officers on patrol. Here we have a famous Riley police car. They also got involved in traffic duty. Effectively, point duty were, was human traffic lights. Here we see a couple of officers in Tewkesbury. The one with the white sleeves is on point duty. Very peculiar dress in the late 1930s. They were in plus fours, as you can see there. I'm glad I didn't have to wear them. And for some reason, they've got a companion there, a little poodle dog who's come to help them do their patrol. After the First World War, we see police women being used as proper police officers, sworn in as constables for the first time. They'd started to be used during the Great War to stop women, young women, drifting into prostitution near armament factories. After the First World War, they became a recognized part of the police scene. And here we can see Gloucestershire, the Gloucestershire Police Women's Unit in 1921. Gloucestershire was amongst the first forces to fully employ police women. I mentioned a moment ago that forces at the end of the 19th century didn't have the forensic capability, even basic forensic capability, to deal with murders like the Ripper murders. But towards the end of the 19th century, this important te technological breakthrough happened. Fingerprints. People had known about the patterns on the ends of fingers for decades. What they didn't realize that they were unique. What they didn't realize that you could build up a crime picture by collecting these fingerprints from scenes of crimes and comparing them against a very primitive database. New Scotland Yard was the first fingerprint bureau in the world in 1901. And here are the people who were uh, using those fingerprints. This is the Gloucestershire Constabulary CID in the 1930s. They look a little bit stilted here, but remember that was the dress of a sports and trilby hat. And this represents the cutting edge of their technology. This is the major incident. Doesn't look much, but it's got all you need to investigate the murder. Fingerprint kit. It's got labels, it's got string, it's got clipboards, it's got the investigation manual. You could take that, like in the Agatha Christie uh, f films and plays, take that to your incident room and set up investigating the scene of the crime. And that's how it stayed through the Second World War. But then in the 50s, things really came under pressure. British society began to change in a revolutionary way. The first thing, is that the towns and cities began to spread. Think of any town or city now, take away all the housing that has been built since the 1950s, and our towns and cities are very much more compact affairs. But in the 50s and 60s, they began to spread like this. The flight to the suburbs, as it was known. Telephones became more popular, more widespread. 
there were easier things to entertain yourself with, like the transistor radio. But these were cheap, easy to manufacture, very popular and very easy to steal. Cars suddenly became for the people. This is the famous Ford Popular. Again, something that was worth having, something that was worth stealing. We then had the explosion of youth culture. Here we have the Teddy Boys. They were beginning to assert youth culture throughout the country. And then British society itself became more diverse with the Windrush generation. All of these things were going on and at the cutting edge of where these changes were taking place, the police force. The problem was the police were still operating in a way that Peel would have recognized. Here they are. This is the police station in Cheltenham uh, where the old uh, for, uh, uh, rural uh, uh, commission used to be and is now some very posh flats just off Lansdowne Crescent. Here they are parading for duty. They've been brief, they've been told what their beats are and here they are going out on duty. It was a 19th century way of policing in a 20th century world and people realised this couldn't go on and in 1960 there was a royal commission under this man, Sir Henry Willink, the Willink Commission and he set off dealing with the problems as he saw them. Some of the problems were revolutionary solved. This one here, panda cars. Take the officers off the beat, put them in cars and give them a personal radio, not just radioing the car, but radioing the officer. Fast crime car responses. Here we have what elsewhere would be called a Z car. There it is. This happens to be outside uh, the arch at Sirencester Abbey. And there we have a fast response car. Forces themselves were reorganized. The number of forces at the beginning of the 20th century was 200. By nine, the mid 1960s, it had become 117. And you can see them here. Each borough, each county had its own force. Those numbers were rapidly reduced at the end of the 60s and early 70s to just 43. Gloucestershire there, number 14 Bristol City, historic borough, right from the beginning of borough policing, that amalgamated with South Gloucestershire, Bath and Somerset to become Avon and Somerset. We can see how this worked in the southwest. Beginning of the 1960s, you had the individual county forces and the boroughs. By the mid 1970s, it had been reduced to just five forces. Over the decades of policing, we've seen several big issues that have operated one way or another throughout police history. Terrorism, this case, Fenian terrorism. This is the Clerkenwell prison atrocity at the end of the 19th century. But in the middle of the 20th century, the Harrods bombing. In the early years of the 21st century, the suicide attack on Tavistock Square. Terrorism has been a constant theme. How did the police op uh, react to this? By setting up the special branch, an interesting hybrid. It's not a secret police force. It's a fully accountable force, part of every local constabulary, but it deals with crimes of terrorism, crimes against the state. In the 1980s, we saw riots and the tension that grew in the inner cities. This happens to be St. Paul's in 1980, April 1980, where I was a police officer in the early 1980s. It wasn't on duty that day, but there we can see the riot that happened in St. Paul's. PC Blakelock in 1985 at the Tottenham riot. Here we can see officers deployed in Handsworth in Birmingham. A very difficult time for the police service, but it didn't stop. 2011 riots all the way across the country. Another systemic issue. How did the police deal with it? Well, it tried to deal with it by community policing, releasing community tension, by increasing ethnic diversity, but also by becoming more professional in the way it deployed to riots. But it's still important to remember there is no specialist riot police in this country. The groundbreaking ex uh, investigations, Sutcliffe of the Yorkshire Ripper, Colin Pitch, first man to be arrested and convicted using DNA evidence. Stephen Wright, the Ips prostitute murderer. The contrast between Sutcliffe and Wright within three weeks of the start of his murderous uh, sequence of crimes, Wright was investigated 
where Sutcliffe went on for several years. What was the difference? DNA. The West case, the Cromwell Street murders, a huge investigation, one of the largest investigations this country has ever seen. Groundbreaking techniques used in that investigation by the Gloucestershire Constabulary. And Hanratty, the A6 murder. For decades, people said he was innocent. People claimed to be with him the night he was supposed to be committing those murders. Eventually, of course, he was convicted and hanged, but people tried to get him posthumously pardoned. It never happened because eventually DNA evidence was found that linked him unequivocally with the A6 murders. Those group are murderers. The poor lad on the right there, Stephen Lawrence, is the victim. The, he revealed that murder revealed striking inadequacies in the Metropolitan Police, both in terms of their investigative capability and in terms of their community relations. And that led to the McPherson inquiry. Lord McPherson died just last week and a revolution in the way police community relations had to develop from there on in. If you want to look at the way technology is developed, this is the Gloucestershire Constabulary Control Room in the late 1950s. Here it is now, and this is only a bit of that control room. Each desk, as you can see, has got more than one computer screen on it. Everything is digital. It is a very slick, very well-organized operation. Here's early police primitive radio. He's got a walkie-talkie on his back. You can see him there speaking into his walkie-talkie set. Here is the modern police radio. That radio is multi-channeled, it's encrypted, and it's not just a radio, it's a phone, and it can operate anywhere in the country. Beginning of the 2010s, we saw a change in the way police was governed. Up until that point, magistrates and councillors, committees, had looked after the governance of policing. In 2010, the coalition government was elected. 2012, we have individual police and crime commissioners elected for each area. Before 2012, I couldn't have told you the political complexion of police governance across the country. Now we know exactly. The red areas are labour areas, the blue areas, conservative areas, the greys, independents, and if you are wondering, the green areas, Plaid Cymru over in West Wales. Politics of numbers have been a constant theme again. How many police officers are there? Which party can boast the greatest increases? Well, we can see where that trend has gone since the mid 1970s. Numbers have grown. But in the last few years, they have been cut back as a result of that big recession in 2008. And you can see that in terms of police officer numbers, we're back to where we were at the beginning of the 2000s. There is a plan for 20,000 police officers to be recruited, but we're only in the foothills of those numbers being recruited. And look how the appearance of policing has changed. You can see these officers here, firearms officers, they've got their gas masks on. Why would you need to put officers out in nuclear, biological, chemical warfare gear? Well, you only have to ask the police of Salisbury to know the answer to that question. Here's what modern officers look like to make sure that they are conspicuous. We're going back to the early days of policing. Preventive patrol by conspicuous police officers. I leave you to draw your own conclusions as to whether the modern baseball cap is an improvement on the police helmet or indeed the top hat of the 1829s. But you can see with that final picture just how policing has evolved from the very, very basic kind of local community policing we saw in the Anglo-Saxon and early medieval period to the high tech police we see today. But there is one thing in common at the heart of our policing system in this country is a citizen locally appointed holding authority under the crown the constable and no politician to this day can tell a constable how to exercise those powers of enforcement that they hold on our behalf thank you very much